This is Karen. I'm calling from Dana Point. Welcome to Tanakh Talk. I'm your host, William Hall, broadcasting live out of Kingsland, Texas, USA, with another episode of Rabbi Tobias Singer's Let's Get Biblical Q and A, coming to you from the Holy Land, as always, Rabbi the Man, Tobias Singer. Welcome back, sir. How are you this awesome day? I'm doing really <laughs> well. You're sounding very cheery today. Yeah, you tend to do that to me sometimes. Okay. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> I was just thinking about things we talk about off air. We should I should just like start recording from the moment I get a hold of you and that way we can have some bloopers to add into the end of the show. <laughs> yeah. No, that's the best part of the show actually. Yeah. <laughs> the best part. That's the part that really matters. That, of course, that's the only important part. Just kidding. Yeah. Awesome. Okay, well cool. Uh I'll, well I, I have to ask you, how are you doing, man? You're looking great. You're looking healthy. I'll tell you, that goes without saying. That <laughs> goes without saying. How am I doing? Um, it's so exciting being on the streets of Yerushalayim, not for the reasons you think, but uh, number one, encountering so many people who did tshuva, who repented, who returned back to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And those of you who came over to me last night last week really means a lot really means a lot and it's also a place where there's so many missionaries who are trying to convert Jews to Christianity it's um that's very it's very traumatizing and it's very traumatizing for Jews that are here I don't think um I think the Christians that are doing this are very deliberately trying to be provocative and then put something on YouTube to oh, yeah. show how horrible the Jews are. Um, but I think that there are a lot of decent Christians out there who don't understand what's going on and how offensive this is. So it's quite a mix, and it's, um, I'm very happy to be able to be in this position to reach out to um, to quite a number of people. That, that's very exciting. You know, we had to take my, uh, my wife's vehicle into the shop, and there was a lady... Um, an older woman in there and she had her phone sticking out of her purse playing some sort of a podcast it was really loud and it was about is about the new new testament jesus stuff for like like i mean she knew what she was doing she was walking around making sure everybody heard her preaching or whatever that was her way of witnessing or whatever um is is that legal for people to do in israel because i know you can't really i mean like for example if they're going through the grocery store and there's kids around can somebody walk around with their phone preaching you know that's that's preaching the gospel like out of a speaker, whether it's so, I think the laws in Israel are similar to the United States. Like, if you want to speak on the streets, it's legal. But if you want to use a an amplifier, you have to have a license. Hmm. So, like, you could, I guess, I I think you could like just talk on the street. But the moment you introduce a call rum, a like a, a loudspeaker system, so then you need some kind of a license to do that. Now, is it enforced? Not really. Mm. And what happens is missionaries do it here in Israel, and the police generally don't enforce it until it hurts so many people. Mm -hmm. And people are just very offended. And then sometimes the police will step in. And then the missionary will go, okay, okay, okay. And then they just will go somewhere else and, and break that law again. That means they right. promise, they vow to the law enforcement officer that they just won't use a loudspeaker system. And they scream. It's really, it's really very offensive. And... And then they just go somewhere else and just do the right. same thing. <laughs> right. They engage in a lot of that. And it is, it's, it hurts, it hurts the feelings of many people. And um, the people who do it, I know what they're doing. They actually very deliberately um, say things that are very, very offensive, very offensive. And then they wait for someone to respond who, where they're just very hurt. And then they capture that 
out of context and put it up on the social media and the Jews look terrible mm. and they don't care. Right. Um, that's just the way it is. And people who are involved in Jewish evangelism just tend to be much more obnoxious than people who are not. People just who are out there preaching in other places, they're not like this. Here they're doing it really to trigger people to be as offensive as possible and because that's what they want. They want that kind of response. Mm -hmm. and it's, it's very hurtful to people because it's like our refuge. Yeah. Like we're here to escape Christians. So but there are a lot of Christians I think that are would be sensitive to this if they understood what's really going on. All right. Okay, well, uh, let's get right on into our first topic. Uh, let me play this real fast. Here we go. Make sure you can hear this. All right. This is Karen. I'm calling from Dana Point. And my question is as follows. What part of the New Testament is true? Thank you. All right. Succinct. Take it away. So there are many things in the Christian Bible that are true. But anything true in the New Testament isn't new. And anything new in the New Testament isn't true. And so, therefore, in Mark chapter 12, it quotes um, Deuteronomy chapter 6. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is a God, the Lord is one. So that's, of course, true. You should love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and might. That's quoted in the same chapter. That's true. As it turns out, holy books have a way of plagiarizing passages from the Jewish scriptures. The Christian Bible is not an exception. Sometimes the Christian Bible, I'm saying sometimes because I'm trying to be very nice and ecumenical, it's really a lot. It's not only a lot, but it's it's a nightmare. Uh, the Christian Bible uh, deliberately misquotes texts in the Hebrew Scriptures, corrupts them, rips them out of context, assigns a, a meaning to them which was never intended by the prophet, by the author, engages in a exegesis, which means just has, I mean, I mean, as far as Paul in first Corinthians, he takes a passage from the Bible, which says, you should not muzzle an ox when it's threshing. So an ox in particular is an animal that is a, 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 a beast of burden, but oxen, um, are not quite like dogs, but they have like a connection with the owner. They're smart, and you can train an ox, and there's a connection there. You know, so when you when the ox is treading, you can't put a muzzle on him because what it's treading the is its food. It's not right. So Paul actually says in First Corinthians, he says, First Corinthians chapter nine. Do you do you think God really cares about oxen? That's yes, he does. You know, Paul's making the point that it has nothing to do with an ox and nothing to do with that commandment. It has to do with um, giving money to missionaries who are out there. I'm not kidding. And then these same Christians who believe in that and tout that say that we don't believe in an oral law. So when Paul makes things up completely, that oral law we believe in, but the one, okay. So that's all said. I'll just take this question from another angle. Do I think that anything in the Christian Bible is historical, is historically valid? So the question is, I have asked this frequently, and the problem is that we have no contemporaneous writers that are non-Christian who wrote a word about Jesus. There was no one in the first century let alone the first half of the first century, who was not a Christian that wrote anything about Christianity. And there were people around who might have, who really, 
I would think would have Philo. Philo lived during the first half of the first century. He was born in 20 BCE, died in the 50s. So he was around and he wrote a lot and didn't write anything about it. Um, so, but this question, like, what is historical? Can we say that there is anything in the Christian Bible that actually is historical? Well, it's quite likely. I mean, you know, as it turns out, books that are that whose core message is not true often uh, say some things that are true, right? You know, Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court is fiction, but there are historical figures there and um, Hamlet and so on. There, So people, this is the quest that scholars have. It's been going on for a long time, hundreds of years. And, and some of the Albert Schweitzer, his 1906 work on the quest for the historical Jesus, maps this all out. But there really is only one rigorous method to figure out, to deduce anything in the Christian Bible that is historical. You can't, there are many methodologies that you can use and you can remain consistent with, like verisimilitude, things that sort of match your preconceived notions of what a Pharisaic Jew would be and just say these people map onto it or whatever, you know. But I don't, that's not a very strong method. It's a method, but it's not very vigorous because there are just so many possibilities. And you have to be very careful with this because, you know, people who are scholars of the Christian Bible, you know, use, employ these methods because they were established by um, thinkers, by German New Testament scholars, but none of these methods are really rigorous except one one method is the only method you could you could take to the bank is what is called frequently called the criteria of embarrassment so i think that is very rigorous as an example we're told in the christian bible that uh, paul just was fighting with everyone he was just, and he was fighting with people that you wouldn't expect him to be fighting with. Barnabas is an example. So Barnabas is the guy who introduced Paul to the Jerusalem church in the book of Acts. And that the two of them would have a complete parting of ways, and Paul wouldn't travel with his cousin, Mark, John Mark, like, why would someone invent that? That's just so embarrassing. And that Second Peter would have to jump in and just go that everyone's on the same page. It's very obvious that there was enormous tension between Paul and Peter. And what we find in Galatians 2, that Paul is saying that he had a, a confrontation with Peter for being a hypocrite. It's just inconceivable that just that never happened. There was no tension. Someone would make that up. And why would someone invent the idea that Paul just couldn't get along with? These are fellow Christians. These are not people who thought that um, this movement was completely silly and didn't believe in Jesus at all. These are people who we're told were Christians. Now, the word Christian is not, well, actually does appear in the Christian Bible a few times, but it's not really used by Christians, but we'll just call it that. So to me, that's, that is for sure a rigorous methodology. Now, Christians concede this point and seek to weaponize it in a way that's not valid. So they go, well, why would you have women at the tomb, you know, saying that they you know, saw Jesus resurrected. Like, why women, why not men? Isn't the testimony of women in a Jewish court worthless? This is 
all nonsense. It's garbage in, garbage out. Because this is not a test smell, this is not a court. And this is going to be offensive to people, and if it's offensive, what am I going to do? Um, typically speaking, it's women that have these visions of Mary and whatever. Not that anyone went to the tomb, that never happened. But was there um, a woman who was out of her mind that said that Jesus came to her? And this woman, we're told in Luke, had demons cast out of her? Yeah, that's Luke chapter 8. Our only encounter with Mary Magdalene outside of the Passion narratives. That doesn't count. Moreover, in the Christian Bible, the point is, especially in the Gospels, that Jesus came from um, from a dishonorable background or plain back. He was he was born in a in a manger, a trough where horses eat from, in a barn. That's certainly the case in Luke. It's not. It doesn't work with Matthew's infancy narrative because Matthew's infancy narrative has the family start in Bethlehem and they don't need an inn. So that's the whole point. That. So I think that I think possibly what we find in early Mark that his family thought that he was out of his mind. So where would that come from? So it could be that just people of his own community didn't like him. It could be. And in fact, um, the notion that a prophet is not without honor except from his own countrymen is in the, the Christian Bible, and in the prologue of John, he came to his own, but they received him not. So that general attitude that the Jews were going, no, this is not, that probably has truth to it. Just like um, when you have people going around who, there are were, were people who said that smoking is beneficial, is good for you, and so on, but doctors are going, no, they're not, and they should be, their license, medical license, should be revoked. There are people like that. There was a guy who said that there's no relationship between HIV and AIDS, and he was a doctor. They threw him out. That doesn't mean, but, so, you'd be very careful with other methodologies you know, verisimilitude, you can hear those two Latin words, you know, that it, it sort of matches on something, but you, it, it requires another hypothesis that we know where he comes from. It's not, it's not something that you should just reject out of hand, but when people use it, although it's absolutely true, this is a, this is a soft science. This is not where you're getting a blood test and it goes to the lab and the lab is testing your blood type and your, you know, cholesterol. You know, that's rigorous where it could be replicated and could be tested. This, this is not a hard science and people should recognize this soft science. And I think within the soft science, just studying history, that's a soft science. New Testament scholarship is a soft science. And the people I think that are would be very good at uh, examining, critically examining the Christian Bible are people who come from an Orthodox Jewish background because they're able to see what matches and what doesn't match. Um, so the only things that I can assure you within almost certainty is that Paul could not get along with anyone. We have met people like Paul. I am sure you've met people who are just so disagreeable. People either you, in your family, just some uncle, some cousin, some your mother-in-law, whatever it is, there's somebody who just is impossible to get along with, who just have very difficult, abrasive, disagree, just disagreeable people. That's what Paul was like, and that you could take to the bank. Because it's it is not possible. It's, it's absolutely inconceivable that this will be made up. Now, you could say that that people didn't know who Jesus was during his lifetime. It's, that kind of fits in, and you see that in the Christian Bible. No one knew who he was. Now, why would that be included if it wasn't true? 
like he's, it's very likely that the whole idea that he was the Messiah really comes up after he dies, and then because or else how did Matthew sixteen get in there? Who do you say I am? Nobody knows. Or Peter said that. That's. It seems like people really had no idea who he was, and then, and in Matthew's passion narrative, people doubted it. So there must have been like why are there are these doubting passages. That they're just people who are, even from within the circle, are doubting much of this. So that would point in the direction that Jesus never claimed to be the Messiah. That's a claim made for him. And that would be consistent with Talmudic literature. He's never, while Jesus is never, um, he's not spoken of in a very flattering way, but he's not called a false Messiah. It would, it would map onto that. But that Paul had the personality of Sigmund Freud, who was just not the nicest person in the world, who really didn't get along with people. So that was Paul. That you can take to the bank. No one would invent it. And I encourage you, the viewer, to look at the Hebrew Bible. Always do that. Become a, not just acquainted with Isaiah and Jeremiah, but feel Ezekiel and Daniel. Like feel it. Like inhale it. It should be a part of you. And once you are so acclimated to things that are pure and holy, you'll immediately be able to sniff out those things that are those things that are toxic, those things that are not pure, those things that are not of God. If you're not utterly acclimated to the Hebrew Bible, just everything, you, if you're just walking around and all you're doing is you're exposed to sewage, so you have no idea what clean air smells like. If all you're doing is you're growing up with people who just smoke around you, so you become so acclimated to it, you don't even smell. The people who just don't smoke and don't live around anyone who does smoke could immediately sniff out the presence of tobacco immediately. So that's very, there's no other way to do this, but to really become acquainted with that which is holy and pure, and you'll immediately be able to identify those things that are are spiritually detestable. Anyways, we're, we're, a time is coming where all the world will speak in that pure speech, and we we look forward to that moment when the words of Zephaniah will be fulfilled, that all the nations will speak besafo beruda in a pure speech. Mm-hmm. Hopefully that will happen very soon in our time. Thank you for your question. Awesome. Great question. All right, moving on to the next caller. Caller, you are live on the air. Please tell us your name and where you're calling from. Yeah, my name is Matthew. I'm from New York. Hey, Matthew. Um, my, yeah, just a quick, just a quick uh, a preface. Uh, I just wanted to say that um, I've been looking into your guys' show, and uh, I just wanted to say that most of the objections that the rabbi comes up with for Christianity have been asked and answered for over 2,000 years. Um, they've had medieval debates for centuries on these subjects, and I just encourage people to look at those two while while we're here. Um, but real quick, um, you mentioned uh, Jeremiah, um, Jeremiah 31. Uh, uh, because Jeremiah 31 is misquoted by Hebrews 8. Um, but what you fail to mention is that they're not copying from the Hebrew text. They're copying from a Greek translation of the Hebrew text. Um, so my question is, how does he reconcile the fact that the Jews who um, uh, wrote those Greek translations are actually responsible for the Christians who are copying them down later on? I, I I I was following you and then I lost you, so just that I I don't I don't I just didn't understand you at no, the yeah, no problem no no problem please um you met you then you just mentioned a couple minutes ago Jeremiah you said read Jeremiah um you've also mentioned in the past and other shows chapter thirty one verse thirty two is misquoted by Hebrews chapter eight verse is nine misquoted by Hebrews um, yeah but I think that the the question I'm asking is Everybody knows that post, after the once the Second Temple was restored and Alexander the Great conquered the Persian Empire, there was a Hellenization of the of the Jewish um, religion and also Jewish scriptures. The Jewish scriptures were translated from Hebrew into Greek, so that they, their ideas could be spread throughout the world, because Greek uh, Greek was the lingua franca, Frank, the lingua franca at the time. And um, everybody knows that that most people back then were reading in Greek. They were not reading Hebrew scriptures. And so my question is, if 
uh, Hebrews chapter 8, verse 9 misquotes Jeremiah 31, 32. It's true because Jeremiah 31, 32 is originally in Hebrew, but the mistranslation is caused by the Greek translation, which was translated by Jews living in a Hellenized world. So my question to you is, how do you reconcile that? So in other words, you're saying that th- there was no mistranslation. It was just translated from Greek, not Hebrew. Yeah, well, I mean, not even necessarily a mistranslation, but the Jew- Jews who were God-fearing, monotheistic Jews at the time translated it in a way that the Christians cannot be blamed for, clearly. Oh, so how, uh, so just just do this. I mean, the viewers don't know this, so you can keep them on. You can keep them on. Jeremiah, on. Keep them on for a second. Yeah, not a problem. How do you know that there's a Jewish a Jewish translation, a translation that was rendered by Jews, authentic Jews, from the Greek, from into Greek? That means, what translation do you have like that? Well, I mean, I can turn the question around and say, how do you don't know? I, all I know is that Greek was a language. How do you that don't know? No, just say, I'm asking a question. Your question is very important. You're saying that there is a translation of Jeremiah into the Greek language that we know was created by Jews and rendered Jeremiah 31 in a way that's consistent with the book of Hebrews. What is your... No, where is this... No? Then I didn't that's understand that. That's, that's not what I said. I, I, mis- oh, I misunderstood so, uh, it also. You do, take, could you just say it a little slower? Just, just your point. No, yeah, no problem. No, no problem. Because I'm, you, I'm, I'm agreeing it's, it's, with, I'm agreeing with you. I'm agreeing with you that Hebrews chapter eight verse nine um, may not be completely accurate to the Hebrew scriptures. It's the opposite. But what it's I'm not saying like completely is, accurate. It's the exact opposite. But well, continue. No, it's not. It's not. It's, it's the real the the trans, Well, I mean, it's not exactly the complete opposite. It actually doesn't affect the it actually doesn't affect the meaning of Hebrews chapter eight verse nine. The message is trying to convey, but that's a different story for a different time. Um, my question is the the I'm just this let's just this is a thought experiment. The person writing to Hebrews chapter eight verse nine is reading chapter thirty one thirty two, but he's not reading the Hebrew text because Hebrew texts back then were not like. It's not like every single person had access to them. It's not like every single person could even read them. That's why the Greek translations were made. And the Greek translation, he's writing word for word what he's reading on the page in Hebrews chapter 8, verse 9, in Greek. But that Greek translation was translated by Jews living in a Hellenized world. And the author is but writing. We don't, we don't, none of that, that survives. <laughs> Only thing we have is what is called the Septuagint that comes right through the fingers of Origen, a third century church father, and others. He's not the only one. So if there was a translation into Greek that was rendered by completely religious Jews, okay, and I am sure there was such a translation, it doesn't survive. So What's the point? Oh, we, we do have what's called the Septuagint, but that comes right from the church, right? So yes, what comes is, from true. the church, that, of course, is going to be altered in order to comport with the book of Hebrews and other books in the New Testament. That means we don't have a, a Greek translation that we know was from Jewish sources of Jeremiah 31. So are you, say, are you saying that the book of Jeremiah was never translated into Greek? No, just the opposite. I'm sure it was. It just doesn't survive. So then how could you make a judgment on... I, I mean, you could say I can't make a judgment, which is fine, but then how could you make a judgment and say that Hebrews chapter 8, verses 9, completely misquotes, if you know that they're reading Greek? Right, so I, I do start with the assumption... I do start with the assumption that the Hebrew Bible is the original, that Jeremiah preached in Hebrew and wrote in Hebrew, and therefore only the Hebrew is reliable. I mean, that's so... If if I'm wrong why? about that, then nothing I'm saying is true. That means that, that's the oh, whole why, point. Why the Hebrew? point... Let me just for a moment. The missionary argument is that the Hebrew Bible points to Jesus. If that's not their claim, then everything I am saying is wrong. It's, it's based on that um, uh, claim, and that claim is fatuous, it's vacuous. Now, if that's not their claim, tell me what their claim is. Isn't oh, no, that their I'm, claim? I, I, mean, I, agree, I agree with their claim. I, Go ahead. I agree with their claim. 
I know I agree okay. with their claim that the Hebrew Bible points to Jesus. I'm, I mean, we can go, we can, you know, we could dig deeper into this for, for hours. Well, let's if not dig to. deeper. I mean, Just I, stay I with me. The Hebrew yeah, yeah, says, no, no, I'm, I'm I'm not to, I'm to Yeah, no, I think, I think that you, I, I agree that the Hebrew scriptures do point to Jesus, um, but do point I'm, to I'm, Jesus I'm not here don't. to argue for the missionaries. I'm not here to argue for the missionaries. All I'm, ta- all I'm saying is I'm pointing out something you mentioned. And you've mentioned quite a few times when you use this as an argument, say why Christianity is not true. You've even called it, if I'll, I'll quote you, you even called it a criminal religion, the fact that Jeremiah yes. and Hebrews don't completely perfectly align. So, I mean, if you want to go that route, we can talk about places in the Old Testament where Old Testament prophet scriptures don't align with each other. But that's a completely different story. Um, I, I'm, but I I'm do not, agree that I'm not following. Hebrews, look, I'm not following you completely. I'm really not. The Hebrew Bible sure says, and the text for those of the viewers who are listening, is the text in Jeremiah 31, and it's verse 31 in the Hebrew Bible, ends with, I was their husband. And the same exact word is used in Jeremiah uh, chapter 3, verse 14. It's a word that only appears a few times in all of Tanakh. In the book of Hebrews, chapter 8, verse 9, it says, and I disregarded them. That's the opposite. Vanuchi ba'alti bum means I was their husband. And uh, I will credit the King James for rendering it correctly in Jeremiah 31, verse 32 in the Christian Bible, and 31 in the Hebrew Bible. The book of Hebrews is not just... Um, not translating it properly, it's diametrically opposed. Moreover, uh, and thank you for your question, moreover, in case any viewer thinks that I'm being picky or pedantic, that's the whole point of Hebrews 8. The whole point of Hebrews 8 is to say that whatever is old is going to vanish and disappear. I mean, the whole point of Hebrews 8 ends with the last passage. In that he says that there is a new covenant, he makes the first one obsolete. And what is obsolete and outdated disappears. So the whole point of the book of Hebrews is to demonstrate that Judaism is a false religion. The book of Hebrews contains the longest argument against the Jewish faith, 13 chapters against Judaism. So that's the whole point of Hebrews, is that um, that Judaism is just a shadow. I mean, see Hebrews chapter 10. I mean, that's the whole point of it. And that maps, it's not written by Paul, but it certainly maps on to Paul, uh, Colossians 2, 16 to 17. So, the Hebrew text says, "Va'anochi ba'altibam." I was their husband. It's by the way, this is the language of Jeremiah. The word "ba'al" appears many times in Tanakh, but that exact construction, "ba'alti," only appears in three places in all of Tanakh. The root is all over the place, but that construction. Only exact word with its all its vowels only appears in three places in Tanakh. One in Deuteronomy chapter 9, verse 9, the second time in Jeremiah 3, 14, and the third time in Jeremiah 31, verse 31. Again, 32 in the in the Christian Bible, because the the the, the, the chapters passages are numbered differently. In where that ver- word appears in Jeremiah 3, 4, 14, every, the Christians get it right. Okay? The Septuagint on Jeremiah 31, excuse me, on Jeremiah 3, 14, gets it right. It's corrupted in Jeremiah 31. Now, I, 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 we need to just sort this out. It's not that translators render text somewhat differently. It's not that. If it were that, that would be fine. They actually they do, because, because as it turns out, translations are commentaries, for sure. So people phrase the things differently. But in fact, this is a criminal act, because the book of Hebrews is mischaracterizing what Jeremiah says. The context of Jeremiah 31 is that God made a covenant with the Jewish people when they 
when they came out of Egypt. God took them by the hand out of Egypt, and they, the, the children of Israel, broke my covenant, although I was their husband. I mean, the whole point is, the rub is, if God disregarded them, so the Jews would, it blows up the whole meaning. The whole meaning is that I was your husband. I was your lover. Like, what did you do? Like, I kept my side of the agreement because that's what a covenant is. A covenant is not a Torah. A covenant, it means an agreement. So the whole point of Jeremiah 31 is Hashem is saying, I was your husband. I was loyal to you. I never slept around on you. I never committed fornication against you. And it, it and just know that this theme of being dishonorable in your relationship with God is adultery, is all over Jeremiah. That's Jeremiah 3, famous chapter. It's all over the place. So Jeremiah is using this as an example of a husband and a wife. And God, the husband, was loyal in his... Uh, marriage to the Jewish people, but conversely, the Jewish people were disloyal. When you say the Anoichi Baalti Bum means that I disregarded them, as Hebrews 8 9 says, it's not that you haven't done justice to the original text. You've you've raped the original text. You've violated the, the original text on the most on the most fundamental level. It's wrong. And in a sense, it, it's so stupid. I mean, I'm, I'm trying to make sense out of nonsense, out of Play-Doh. The, the, the reason why Hebrews does this is plain. Hebrews 8 wants to show that the covenant God made with the Jewish people has been superseded completely. Everything's been superseded. That Christ is our high priest. He's above the angels, above Moses, above Josh. That's the whole point. And the Old Testament is gone and and has disappeared. This is how Hebrews 8, verse 13 ends. Please read it for yourself. Please do. I want to make this point. The claim of the church is that I could prove to you that Jesus is the Messiah from your Hebrew Bible. Right? That's the claim of Jews for Jesus. There are many people listening to my voice now, watching me right now, who are or were Christians. You know I'm not lying. You know I'm not mischaracterizing this. The claim of the church is that I can prove to you that Jesus is the Messiah from your Hebrew Bible, from your Old Testament. Not from a, a translation. That's a scam. That's just that. I mean, if you walked into a car dealership and and they mischaracterized what the contract says, you would you would take them to court. I mean, this is criminal activity. It's just wrong. And no, it's not a different translation. It's not. I was their husband, Vonechi Baaltibum, is the polar opposite of I disregarded them. It's the opposite. And to the credit of not all Christian, there are some, but the vast majority of Christian Bibles, strangely, in Jeremiah 31, verse 32, do correctly translate that word as, I was their husband. Not everyone, but the vast majority of them, including the most famous ones. Right? And then Christians go, but we have a the Septuagint. The Septuagint, the original, what's called really the Proto-Septuagint. That means the original Septuagint that was translated in about the year 250 BCE for the Alexandrian Library that has burnt down. It was destroyed over and over again. The most priceless manuscripts in, were destroyed. It was destroyed. It, not once, but destroyed. That translation was gone with it. And that was only of the five books of Moses. So 
that there was a Greek translation of the Torah, the five books of Moses, we know that from every source, from everything, from the Talmud to the letter Aristide, we just know it. It's all over Josephus. We know that. It's only of the five books of Moses. Was there a cottage industry of people translating the Hebrew Bible into the Greek language? Yes, of course. Of course there was. I'll, I'll, I'll share something with you very strange. If you read the preface to the King James Bible, and I'd imagine not many people do this, I encourage you to do it. So the King James was Bible, the translation was commissioned in 1607. 47 men in good standing with the Church of England were commissioned, the people who were the highly educated people from Cambridge, Oxford, they were commissioned to translate um, the, the, the Bible into the English language, okay? And they were really translating, well, they were really using the Tyndale Bible, probably 85 or 90% of their translation, but they updated the translation and they certainly, but they write, they write, and these guys never met a Jew in their lives because there were no Jews in England in the early 17th century. They write in the preface of the King James that we can't translate from a Septuagint because there are so many Greek translations out there. We don't know. We, we're trans, we're, they say they're translating from the Hebrew, but they concede this point. Jerome concedes this point is an introduction to the book of Chronicles. This is known. So I want to just concede this point. If Christians are saying that the truth of Christianity cannot be demonstrated from the Hebrew Bible, but from some Greek translation done by someone we don't know who it was, I concede, then I concede everything. But that's not their claim. Their claim is that it's the Hebrew Bible that demonstrates the veracity of the Christian religion, not some Greek translation. They just drag in their fig leaf, the Septuagint, to rescue them from these existential problems. Existential because these mistranslations are not, uh, were not mistakes. There are mistakes in translations. There was one translation, uh, there was one Bible called, I think it was called the Sinner's Bible, Thing was called that, where where it says in the Ten Commandments, "Thou shalt not commit adultery." So they left out "not" and said, "Thou shalt commit adultery." I'm not kidding. That's a mistake, right? And it was, people are surprised that there was such a thing, but there was such a thing. People make mistakes. This, in fact, the King James was corrected quite a number of times because of through just errors. People make mistakes. This is not, and people cannot raise the point that there was a Greek translation floating around that comes right out of origin. We know it comes out of origin. And we don't know who wrote it, and that's going to be a... What? That wasn't the claim. The claim is it's the Hebrew Bible, and these are criminal mistranslations. Moreover, Jeremiah 31 is not talking about a new Torah. It's talking about a new covenant. And the context is that in the Messianic age, Jeremiah tells us, the Jews will be restored and never be exiled again, and the Jews cannot be destroyed because the Lord says, look up. If there's a sun, you see the, the moon and the stars, can the very earth, the foundations of the earth be measured? If these can be measured, then so too will I cast off the children of Israel from being a nation before me. That's the whole point. So the Jews broke their promise. God kept his promise. I was their husband. You see, when you molest the text, it's not this you're not, you're destroying the whole point. And you are committing a crime against God. God is saying, I was their husband. If you translate Jeremiah 31 as that I disregarded them, that means God broke his covenant. The whole point is God didn't. I was faithful to you. I didn't sleep around on you, but you were sleeping around on me. If you go at Hebrews, you're spitting in the face of God. Don't you understand what's happening? And this is what always happens. It's 
when you change one thing, everything changes. You can't change one thing and presume that nothing else in the program is affected by it. That's never the case. Once you change one thing, everything has changed. Everything is altered. So yes, the premise for the Jewish people, our faith, our, our, the foundation of our faith is the Hebrew scriptures, not some Greek translation who we don't know. And moreover, just one other point for everyone to consider. Now, Catholics need not listen to this. But what is the apocryphal writings doing in the Septuagint? Like, why, why is the Book of Maccabees in the Septuagint? Really, was the Book of Maccabees also... It's so stupid, because the Book of Maccabees was written after the proto-Septuagint. Maccabees occurred in the 2nd century B.C. The Septuagint was... was the proto-Septuagint was 3rd century B.C. You understand how, how vile, how silly... The church mocks itself when it, it summons the Septuagint. Do you understand why? Because the what Catholics call the, the deuterocanonical texts, they're not holy texts. These are Svarim Hachitzainim. They're not holy. Tobit, Judas, that's in the Septuagint. So you Protestants, you don't believe in those books, right? So you're telling me they also, they're in the Septuagint. Go order a Septuagint online. How do they get in there? Why are they there? You know, the answer is because the Septuagint that you get on Amazon was not rendered by the 70 rabbis of 2,250 years ago. And that's the basis of your claim. The whole basis of the claim of Septuagint, which is smoke and mirrors, is that rabbis who didn't have an ax to grind and who were highly regarded, esteemed individual scholars rendered the Bible into the Greek language. And when they came upon these words, they rendered them in a way that was meaningful to Christianity. And then we find the whole thing's a scam. The whole thing's a lie. I mean, how does David Blaine do this? How, does, how do magicians do this? It's sleight of hand. It's misdirection. And that's what's happening now. And we're shedding light on that. And people are repenting because they're discovering this. So it is the Hebrew Bible. If it's not the Hebrew Bible that demonstrates the veracity of the Christian claim, then disregard everything I have to say. That is the postulate. Thank you for your question. All right, very good. Interesting. A lot of good questions and comments today. Yeah. Um, Caller, you are live on the air. Please tell us your name. Where are you calling from? Hey, this is Ryan from Houston. Welcome, Ryan. Go right ahead. Okay, so in the first century... If there were prophecies about the second temple being destroyed, the third temple being built, and, you know, all uh, the other stuff that happens during the redemption, how did anyone believe that Jesus or the others who claimed it were actually the Messiah? Okay. There so, uh, there's, could you repeat that question? Just rephrase it for me, would you? They just... So, uh, there was still prophecy that had to be fulfilled before the Messiah could come. So I'm a little bit confused on how the Jewish population of Israel at the time could believe anyone was the Messiah. You know, um, because the, the, the second temple is still standing. How could the Messiah bring apart the bring the redemption and have the third temple built if the second temple was still standing? Let, let me ask you a question. You, I, you sound like you're an American. Yeah. Yeah. So that means you're one of more than 300 million people with the same citizenship as you. You know how much stuff is out there that is complete nonsense that people believe in, conspiracy theories that are out there and people just believe and they just don't bother looking it up for themselves? And yeah. we live in an info... Thank you for your question. We live in an information age we live in a time where people have access to the Bible. You know what it meant in the ancient world to just read a book? If you wanted a book, someone had to by hand write it. That's what manuscript literally means. And people wouldn't write it on, they would have to write it on very good material because it had to let. You know what it meant is to have access to a book? People didn't. They did, but it was a scroll, whatever it was. It was very difficult. So if today, when there's so much, wherever you are, politically, you, 
you're right when you're a blue state, a red state, a this state, a forget it. People believe so much garbage, so much lies, so much, and they really could look it up and do the investigation. And we live in a time where you could just press a button and look things up. I mean, when I was as a, when I was a youngster, there was no internet. There was, if I wanted to read, whatever, holy books or you had to have a book with you. If I wanted to read the Patristic Fathers, I had I owned the entire everything, the whole series. You had, and that's in the modern age. But we had books with his printing presses. In the ancient world, could you only imagine the what the illiteracy rate was in the ancient world? So people believed also. People didn't travel much in the ancient world. People were born in a city and died in that city. You know what it meant to move? You can get on a flight. You can get a job in California. If you're in Texas, you get a job in, in, in Maine and Florida, and you move. In the ancient world, that was very, very difficult. So, you know, so if today there's so much disinformation at a time when we really have access to primary sources, notice what I do with you, the viewer. I always quote primary sources, always. And I want you to disabuse yourself of secondary, or this guy says, I don't quote, I'm always quoting the, do you know how few people could afford a book in the ancient world? Now, it's true that in Jerusalem, people were more literate than in other places. People didn't have access. Very religious Jews paid careful attention to the Torah, to Tanakh, and therefore they rejected the, the silly claims of the church. So if today there is so much disinformation going on where people have access to original sources, you could just bang, just Go online and just read. You could see the Dead Sea Scrolls for yourself. You could see the great Isaiah scroll from Cave One in the blink of an eye. You could see it, and it's been all rendered and translated for you. <laughs> Need I say more? So the answer is that people were not familiar with the Hebrew Bible. And moreover, one other thing. To understand the ancient world is to divorce yourself from the world that surrounds you. This is very difficult, but if you want to understand history, you have to place yourself in the, where the Jew was in the first century. The, the Jewish people were living under the heel of the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire at its height. You, do you, the Roman Empire will crush you in a second. Jews were the this was the Roman Empire. It was the most powerful empire the world had ever known that we know now would last longer than any other empire by far in history. So in your living in in that under those circumstances, you could not imagine you couldn't imagine that the that the Jews would return and battle their enemies and defeat them. These were just unimaginable. So you had to fantasize about an eschatology that's the only one that seemed to be realistic, and that is God was going to come in and destroy the enemy. It's called an apocalyptic eschatology, and that's how people thought, because it was, this was the empire. This was the Roman Empire. There was Caesar Augustus. So in truth, people at that time were just thought, I guess that's how it has done, because I, I don't see any way we could defeat the empire you know, this, and set up a new kingdom, right? We couldn't. So you have to step into the ancient world of people dying young and people not understanding any way that they can defeat the Roman Empire. It's just, you have, if you don't do that, then you have no understanding of what the ancient world was like. And if you thought that way, then you just thought and just people talked and they didn't have access to the original. Of course, the very religious Jews did and studied, poured over these texts, but other people did not. Thank you for your question. 
Okay, very good. Moving right on into the next color. Color, you are live on the air. Please tell us your name and where you're calling from. Hey, guys. It's Brian from Florida. How are you doing? Hey, welcome, Brian. Uh, so my question has to do about Daniel. Um, it seems to me that, uh, please correct me if I'm wrong, uh, he lived at a very interesting point of time where he witnessed the destruction of the first temple, and he had a slight confusion with Daniel 9 where Gabriel uh, assisted him told him that the second temple would be built and also destroyed. So my question is, uh, we, there's still three chapters left after Daniel 9. Uh, what can the rabbi reveal to us that Daniel saw? Um, you know, it's kind of confusing visions and numbers he's given. But does Daniel see the third temple? Does he see the Messiah, the uh, war of Gog and Magog? I, mis I misunderstood your question earlier. Well, okay. I, I understand them. I okay. Understand. okay, go ahead and uh, hang up now to me for your answer. All right, all right. We okay, got you. you bet. Okay, Rabbi. So we got like six callers still left here. So hopefully, we'll... da Daniel's just on a level that others aren't. In fact, that comes into view in Daniel ten and eleven, where Daniel sees an angel and others don't. Daniel's level. I mean, God called him beloved. Daniel is the resurrection of the dead comes into view. Daniel knew about the time of the end and wanted to reveal it in the last chapter. Um, he is told, shut this book because you can't reveal the time of the end. So Daniel's revelation was very, very strong. In a way, it was unique in that there was almost no one else in history that had that kind of information that Daniel did. But the book is truncated in 12 chapters. So Daniel was an extraordinary man in an extraordinary place. But look, you know, people are looking for mysteries. Look around you. Look what's happening. That's all prophecy, explicit prophecy in Tanakh. And thank you for your question. All right, sit tight one second. I lost my color one. Give me one second. Uh, right, there we are. Okay, caller, you are live. Tell us your name. Where are you calling from? Hi, my name is Tammy. I am calling from Utah. Thank you so much, Rabbi. I'm sorry I get very emotional when it's I okay. think of what the Jewish people are doing for us. Forgive my emotions. I was saved out of Christianity, idolatry, three years ago on Pesach. Thank you very much. Awesome. Rabbi, sure. I would like to know, what is, the, what is God's purpose for Jesus? What is God's purpose for Jesus? Is that your question? That's the question. That's the question. Yes. I can't hear okay. you, but I think you said, oh, I'm what sorry. is God's purpose for Jesus? You should hear him now. That's good. Okay. What is God's purpose for oh, Jesus? Are. Yes. You do you mean why did God allow a religion like Christianity to emerge and flourish? Is that your question? Um What do you are you I, asking like I what mean, is I God's guess. plan for Jesus personally? Do you think no, that do you think that God was using Jesus to distract or what what's, what purpose do you think he could have in God's eyes? That's your question. Histo like right. why is, did why God did allow, allow the what Christian is, religion to become what was God's plan? Okay. Okay. All right, go ahead and hang up now to your answer. Thank you. That question is addressed in the works of Maimonides of why did Christianity emerge and it emerged precisely as the temple was destroyed now this is a very important question as to why christianity you may be able, why not well as it turns out prior to the destruction of the second temple all the religions in the world were very dissimilar to judaism the Jewish faith was the only Abrahamic monotheism in the world. There was no one else who believed that there was one God alone. No one but the B'nai Israel. Of course, there were B'nai Noach, like Naaman, holy people, like Noah. I mean, they were not technically Jews. But that was the only monotheism in the world and the pagan world thought we were a little nutty for that because to them it just the world was so variegated what they saw what they observed it, it couldn't it was inconceivable to them that there was one power behind it all 
the message of the Jews is it's really all those powers you see are from God. In fact, that's conveyed in the name Elohim, that all the powers are really coming from one source. But why Christianity? So there has to be in the world, there must be a false religion. There has to be until the Messiah comes. Do you? Maybe you don't understand why, so I need to convey this. There has to be free will in the world. There must be religions that are not true, but are very compelling and, and persuade a lot of people, and then you have free will. There must be free will in the world. If there was not, virtue would be unattainable, would be impossible. You must know this. So there must be false religions. I mean, God could destroy every false religion in the world immediately, but we would lose our free will. So there has to be, and this is not my words, the Torah says this, I before you I place life, good, death, before you, sin before you, choose life that you may live. Okay, this is very critical. Why? Because there would, could be no, there could be no virtue in what has to be free will. Now, there is one other part of this, one piece of this puzzle that must be come into view. In Tanakh, we are told explicitly that when the true Messiah comes, at the end of the days, all the nations of the world will immediately recognize their error. Immediately, they will be shamefaced and come to the Jews and say, now we know God is with you. It's very critical. And they will figure it out immediately. They'll get it completely. They'll understand their error immediately. Jeremiah 16, and the Gentiles will come to you. And they'll admit, surely you've inherited lies and vanity, whereas there is no truth. How can a man make unto himself gods when they are not? Okay? So the nations of the world, when the true Messiah comes, will immediately recognize their error and come to the Jewish people and pronounce their loyalty to the God of Israel will be bewildered by Jewish suffering. That's what Isaiah 53 is. Isaiah 53 is the soliloquy on the lips of the Gentile nations. Such chutzpah, the church would use this. The nations, how could this be? If the true Mashiach came during the Persian Empire, as an example, what would, like, the, the in the Persian Empire, in the Greek Empire, fashioned by Alexander the Great, there was no concept of Mashiach. In fact, the word Christos, a Greek word, spread around the world. The Greek language spread around the known world because of Alexander the Great. By far the single most important figure in all of Western civilization. I mean, that's why the Greek language and Western thought and philosophy spread, because of Alexander the Great. So how they didn't know what a, a Messiah was. They had no idea what that was. Christ, only Christos meant that oil was poured on you. You can get a massage and you're a Christ. You get a shiatsu massage. So the world, the nature of false religions had to be sharply changed so that when the true Messiah comes, the Gentiles would immediately recognize their error. So Christianity, Hashem allows a false religion as Christianity to supplant the henotheistic religions of the Greco-Roman world. Why? Because if nothing would have changed, if there was no other Abrahamic monotheism, I'm just using that term, even though uh, Christianity is not a true monotheism, but let's just, they call themselves that. So if there was no Christianity, then the world would not even understand that there's such an idea of one God. They wouldn't know what that means, let alone that there's a God who revealed himself to the children of Israel and Mount Sinai, that there's an idea of one God alone, and know what, there is an idea like that. Christians believe that, and went through enormous turmoil seeking to fuse together the radical monotheism in the Jew, of the Jews and the Trinitarian beliefs that were emerging already in the late second century. 
Like, how do you fuse that together? And that's why Christians were fighting at the at the Council of Nicaea. Why were they fighting? Because it's not, it wasn't clear how to do this. They ultimately hide behind unconventional language like persons and hypostatic unions and so on. So all here, now here's the rub, here's the rub. All Christians believe that Judaism is the default baseline. This is very important. So if you don't get what I'm about to say, you won't understand any of this. All Christians admit that one moment before Jesus died, only the religious Jews, the Orthodox Jews, they didn't call them that at the time, the Pharisaic Jews had the truth, and everyone else was wrong. Do you understand that? Every Christian believes, moreover, this will make Christians happy, that if they're wrong about Jesus, if Jesus is not the Messiah, then actually the Jews have the truth. Because Judaism is the default baseline, and Christianity requires another hypothesis on top of it, which makes it less likely. It's just simple. Just like Mormonism is is another accretion on top of Christianity, as Christianity is a, an accretion on top of Judaism, and it's multiple accretions. Okay, you you understand this? And just Occam's razor, the the default, the few few hypotheses are probably point us in the direction of what the truth is. So, listen, Christianity was necessary that those ideas would fill the world and become the largest world religion with two billion people that identify as, that's one third of the world's population, identifying Krishna as somehow. Why? Because when the true Mashiach comes, they will all recognize their error and tend of different languages, of different nations, will grab the shirt of a Jew and say, take us with you, because now we know that God is with you. They'll immediately, they'll be, me, him, and Lushmo, saying, Wazreya, Hashem, I mean, Nicholas, who would have believed this? You understand? So that's why Christianity was allowed to emerge and become successful, because it had to supplant the pagan religions of the ancient world, which had no concept of an Abrahamic religion. And it's interesting that the word pagan actually doesn't mean what you think it means, but the word pagan comes from the word a purple hue who like lived in the suburbs, people who lived far away, because people had a more, um, a more um, primitive views, okay? That's where the, where the word comes from. So that's why Christianity was... Now, one thing Hashem didn't let is that he, Shabbos is only for the Jews. It's only Beni Uvein Bnei Israel. It's only between God and Israel. Exodus 31, verse 16, 17. So he didn't let Shabbos stay with the Christians, and Ignatius was the guy who did it, but moved it to Sunday. You're not you're not doing Shabbos on on. On Shabbos. And there always have been Christian groups who've tried to move the Sabbath back to Saturday, including in our time a a group that emerged in the 19th century, a millenarian group, the Seventh-day Adventists. They they underwent enormous persecution because they're not the only ones. There's always groups like that. They're like, what are you doing? Saturday is supposed to be Sabbath only on Saturday. So that's the reason why Christianity emerged. Christianity emerged because it's the alternative religion that is perfectly, so it's idolatry, it's illicit, but it prepares the world for Mashiach because it is exactly that religion where people can then understand uh, that Judaism is the only truth and immediately disabuse themselves of their former of their former religion. That's why you see the people converting to Judaism they, in big numbers are coming from, they're not coming from the Hindus, they're not coming from the Buddhists, not that none are, it's kind of unusual. So that's why Christianity emerged. That's why Hashem wanted Christianity to emerge because it. Here's the catch. The one of the things that will occur in the Messianic age is the building of the final temple, as you see in the last three passages of Ezekiel 37, last eight chapters of Ezekiel. 
So if the temple's standing, that's not a time when Mashiach can come or would come. He's rather coming when Mashiach is when the temple's destroyed. So the moment the base Hamikdash is destroyed, well, the Messiah is born in a sense. That means Mashiach can come. Because if what he's supposed to do is rebuild the temple, he's not coming while the temple's still standing. So that's the launching point. So that's why Christianity is in the world. It's the alternative religion to the Jewish faith that is um, that is illicit, that is opposed by the God of Israel, but there must be false religions in the world until Mashiach comes, or else there's no free will, right? Um, but it has to be a monotheistic, Abrahamic religion so that people will immediately recognize, ah, Jesus was the Messiah, that means the Jews are right all along. Thank you for your question. All right, moving on to the next caller. Color your level on the air, please tell us your name, where you're calling from. Hi, good afternoon. This is Steve from Brooklyn. How are you hey, all? Steve. Happy and healthy New Year. Welcome back. So, quick question. From a perspective of a missionary, I am not a missionary, thank God, but let, let, let's play the game of what if. Missionary comes over to you and he says, look, I have proof from the Mishnah to vicarious atonement. He'll give you the coordinates. Chapter 2, uh, Mishnah 1 in Nagoyim. Rabbi Yishmael says, I wish I could be the atonement for Israel. And there the context is, we're talking about different skin lesions called saras, leprosy. I wish I could uh, take care of it for them. How do we view this in terms of the Jews not believing in vicarious atonement? After all, in this week's Torah portion, we, wrote, we, we read, every man shall die for his own sin. A, a, a child should not die for the father's sin. How do we how do we um, defend our position and how do we differentiate between what Christians believe and what we believe? That's the question. Yeah. Clear? Very good, Rabbi. Okay, thanks. Looking forward. Okay, thanks. see, see you. Bye bye. Uh, bye bye. All right, go ahead, Rabbi. Deuteronomy chapter twenty-four, verse sixteen. This week's portion: um, Innocent people cannot die for the sins of the wicked. And I don't know who you are watching me right now. I don't know where you live. And I don't know what your political views are. And I don't know what your position is on criminal justice. That said, I am sure that it would break your heart to think that there was any innocent man languishing in a prison in your country. Whether you believe in capital punishment or don't believe in it, it would break your heart to think that one innocent person should be punished for a crime that someone else committed. Now, if you have that sense of justice, don't you think God has at least as much as you, if not more? The notion that a person can die, could suffer for the crimes of another? That's exactly what you don't want to have. That's why whatever country you live in, unless it's North Korea, you want a, a vigorous uh, judicial system in place so that innocent people would be exonerated and only guilty people would be punished. And so simple. And, you know, we're creating the image of God, so we want that. Mice don't care about it. Cats don't care about it. We're in the image of God. We, it, 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 would, it would be vile to us to think that any, we would rather, we would rather that many criminals would escape justice than one innocent person would be incarcerated. Obviously, we have to figure out what that line is we all would rather that, right? Okay. So then what's going on? Well, let's talk about me for a moment. I was born into a world where people around me had numbers on their arms. And I came to know that they were they endured unimaginable suffering because they were Jews. I also was very aware that most Jews, where my family came from, did not survive. My father's father, 
a blessed memory, was one of eight children. He's one of eight children. He came to the United States long before the war. He was he had a job as a rabbi in Pennsylvania. And that's where he met my grandmother in America, who was from Hungary. Okay. During World War II, my grandfather knew, as did other people at the time, that something horrible was happening in Europe. They knew. I had long conversations with my uncle about this. They knew that something very bad was happening. But they did not understand that European Jewry was being destroyed in the worst crime of human history. And my grandfather, who at the time lived in Brooklyn, he came to know that all of his seven brothers and sisters were murdered by the Germans like that. And not only did he come to know that, but basically everybody around him, like it was during World War II, they knew that it was terrible. They knew something terrible was happening, but they did not know the extent of it. They didn't understand the full scope of it. And that at some point after the war, the information just exploded. And my grandfather described it as he just sat on the floor crying. Imagine in one moment you discover that every person in your family is dead, the, including the man after whom I was named, Tovia, his father. And there was no one to comfort you because every home people were sitting shiva. People were mourning it because everyone finds out essentially around the same time and everyone finds out everyone's dead. Do you understand? So, I come to understand this as a child. I was born in 1960, 15 years after the Holocaust. This is the world I grew up in. All the suffering. There were survivors. There were survivors from my family. There were. Most of them were murdered. What effect did it have on me? It was monumental. And I think, I'm fairly certain that I speak for many other Jewish people. With This is a, something, just the awareness of the suffering of my people has shaped how I think, how I develop in my worship and my service and my loyalty to my nation. Of course it did. I am not the same person because of that. If, if that hadn't happened, I don't know what I'd be, but I would not be this. Okay? This is the... This is the worst catastrophe in human history. There's no parallel to it. No parallel to it. So many suffered, and I can assure you that I'm a better person because of it. And then studying the history, understanding the what my people endured because of their faith, because of their loyalty, because of who they were. I don't possess the vocabulary to adequately convey to you the impact that had on my thinking. Now, so really, truly, as a result of these, the suffering of my people, both those who survived and those who didn't, cause enormous healing in me as a Jew. And I will tell you that I have met many non-Jews who have told me that their entire worldview is shaped by the suffering of the Jews. Many. So people are transformed because of the suffering of others. 
And we are told in our holy literature, even in the Talmud, that whoever weeps over the suffering of a tzaddik, all the sins are forgiven. Now, my family that was murdered in Auschwitz, they didn't die for my sins, but their suffering triggered within me a desire to be closer to Hashem. Okay? There's a huge difference. The Christian idea, the Christian idea is not a Christian idea. The Christian idea is very much like the Aztecs, where they thought that you can kill little girls, can execute them in Central America. We have their altars there, and that you can appease the gods, and this way you would get a a a successful harvest. That's grotesque. There were people in the ancient world, far older, that would put their babies in a idol called Molech, a fire, and burn their babies alive. Because they thought that would appease the God. That's an, an abomination. But it is true, and I'm not just speaking for myself. I know there are so many people who think about the martyrdom of Rabbi Akiva, who, whose skin was ripped off of his body with a rake. Masreke shel barzo. As he read the Kriya Shema. I think it affects us. So it is true that the suffering of the faithful causes people to do tshuva. And we have an example of Yoshio, who that's exactly what happened to him. You could read the whole story in Second Chronicles. He was killed in a battle with Egypt. He didn't die for anyone's sins. But his death, where he was shot by an Egyptian archer, caused the nation to do tshuva. They wept. So, And we see in the Talmud that it's not just the Messiah. People are sitting by the gates of Rome suffering Jews with using you. They have leprosy of sorts. They have, and they're all changing their bandages. The Mashiach changes his bandages different than everyone else. So there's it is true that people can conflate two ideas, one very holy and one vulgar. It is a very holy thing to look at those who have suffered and died and say, I'm going to repent. There are many people when they're, when a parent, God forbid, dies, they suddenly they wind up in the synagogue. It just does. It doesn't mean he died because, for your sins. This is not the, the tens of thousands of children that were routinely executed by the ancient natives in Central America. No. No, that's disgusting. That's vile. And in fact, in a passage in Isaiah, Isaiah 57 is an excoriating chapter. It's a chapter where Hashem really is letting it all. He's very angry, let's just say that. And he points out the vile behavior. The prophet says in that passage, I took away the righteous of your generation. No one gave it to heart. Now, people, I can't explain why others suffer. I can't explain it. But these are tzaddikim that are willing to suffer. I'm nothing. I mean, I'm nothing. I'm really nothing. People attack me too. Not like that, but they do. And I know that there are risks. I wish that I could. I don't want to compare myself. But I, I, it would be nice that if I can just lecture in the United States and not have a whole team of security agents. I know there's a risk involved in what I do. I know that, you know, and I take the precautions necessary, and it's in God's hands. The last lecture series I gave in the United States, I was pretty sure I'd come back home alive. I wasn't 100% sure, I, you know, Hashem watched over me. I have to do my 
job and make sure that the people who are, and I wish I didn't, but I wish there was a day that I didn't get hate mails. And I'm nothing. I'm not, I don't, I did compare myself. I just know that people understand the risks of taking on behalf of Kalal Yisrael. Please know that. Please understand that. No one dies vicariously for our sins. The Chafetz Chaim was a great tzaddik. He was a very holy rabbi. He died in 1933, right like when Hitler was coming to at that time. He didn't die for anybody else's sins. He was almost 100 years old. Did people think about it, that a great tzaddik died? Yeah. Was it enough? Maybe for some people, not for everybody. That's all. So a person who suffers or dies, that person can be for others a trigger, could feel their repentance. They didn't die for anybody's sins any more than Yoshiyahu died for the sins of the nation. But when Yoshiyahu, he was the, Yoshiyahu was the greatest of all the, the Davidic kings. Certainly of the, the last, he was the great one. He was a giant. He got killed, and it caused the whole nation to weep. It just did. And they did tshuva as a result of it. You can read about it in the Bible. And if you want, just read Second Chronicles, chapter 34. The whole story is there. Did people do tshuva throughout history because of Yeshiyahu's repentance? Yeah. He didn't die for their sins. And actually, Talmudic sages discuss what did Yoshiyahu do wrong, Josiah do wrong, that he would die. He was a young man. He was not even 40 years old. So don't conflate the two. There's a very grave danger, very grave danger to conflate the two. The suffering of righteous, of martyrs, or people who suffer, trigger within others loyalty. That's all. Not that they die for their sins, like one guy um, robs a bank and you send an innocent guy to prison. No, that's pagan, that's idolatry, that's revolting to the God of Israel, and as you pointed out, expressed explicitly, not only in Deuteronomy 24, verse 16, but Ezekiel 18 and other places. Thank you for your question. All right, very good. And I think we wrapped it up there. I believe so, too. All right. Well, guys, thank you for tuning, uh, for tuning in all the chat. Uh, thank you for the moderators out there. Uh, be sure to go to outreachjudaism.org, get Rabbi's uh, lecture series. I call them lecture series. These, if you haven't done it yet, uh, when you go to the website, click the free audio tab at the top. You'll see, uh, you'll see a bunch of audio recordings that actually the CDs you see on the screen are no longer available. Those files are there. It's not an audio book. If you've got the books, you'll want to go back and, and listen to those uh, those chapters. I guess you could say chapters or whatever that you actually had pre-done uh, because it's extra information. You think you got good stuff now. Hopefully one of these days, Rabbi, I'll get in Volume 3. <laughs> We're looking forward to that. At least I am anyway. So, uh, Rabbi, thank you for your time, and thank you for tuning in. Take care, Always. everybody. Shalom, shalom. Bye-bye. Shalom, my dear friends. Hope this message finds you well. If you like the way this channel is going and the channel has been a blessing to you, please consider supporting the channel by going to the website, tanakhtalk.com. T-A-N-A-C-H-T-A-L-K dot com. Thank you once again for your time and for supporting Tanakh Talk. Shalom. Shafa